Hey everyone, Miss Calabrese here. Welcome back. Um, today we're going to continue our study of the cardiovascular system. All right, so in our last video we talked about, um, about the valves that can be found in your heart. Um, so we have four different valves that you're going to need to be familiar with, um, and those are uh, the atrioventricular valves which are the, the valves that separate the atria from the ventricles. So that's your tricuspid valve and your bicuspid valve or mitral valve as it's sometimes called. Um, and then two semilunar valves as well. Those are the valves that separate the ventricles from the large vessels uh, that exit the heart. So um, the semilunar valves would be the pulmonary semilunar and the aortic semilunar, right? And so these valves basically operate in pairs. Um, so the two atrioventricular valves open at roughly the same time, uh, and then the two uh, semilunar valves open at roughly the same time. All right, so here's um, what these valves look like um, from the top. So this is a, a view of the heart where the, the atria have been removed, and you're looking down um, towards the ventricles, and we can see all four valves from this perspective. Um, so in this picture here, the atrioventricular valves are open. Um, so we can see the, uh, um, the tricuspid valve right here. So that would be the, the passageway from the, the right atrium to the right ventricle, and that one's open now. Um, and over here we can see the bicuspid or mitral valve um, that goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and that one's open. So when these two atrioventricular valves are open, the two semilunar valves are closed. All right, so here we can see the pulmonary semilunar valve. That's the one that's leaving the right ventricle, and here's the aortic semilunar valve. That's one that's leaving uh, the left ventricle. Um, so those two are closed when the atrioventricular valves are open. All right, and here's uh, what the opposite situation looks like. So here we can see your tricuspid and bicuspid valves are closed, uh, and now your both your semilunar valves, the pulmonary and the aortic semilunar valves, are both open. Right, so they kind of alternate when the, when the, the two uh, atrioventricular valves close, the two semilunar valves open, and vice versa. All right, so, um, so these, these valves are, are there. The basic function of valves in your heart is to prevent backflow, right? So we don't want blood to be flowing backwards where it just came from. We want blood to always be moving forward. So, for example, um, when blood is entering your heart, um, blood always enters into the atria. So blood, uh, deoxygenated blood is coming into the right atrium, oxygenated blood coming into the left atrium. When both of those atria squeeze, they're going to push that blood down uh, through the atrioventricular valves into the ventricles. Uh, and once that blood is pushed into the ventricles, then we want the atrioventricular valves or the AV valves um, to close behind them. So we want to close those doors so that when the ventricles squeeze, they're not pushing blood back into the atria. Instead, they're pushing it forward um, into, the, uh, into the large vessels that leave the heart. All right, so the valves are there to prevent the backflow of blood into the atria. Um, so uh, these, these basically work by pressure differences. So, so when your ventricles start to contract, they're putting pressure, uh, in, the, we create pressure on the inside of the heart. That pressure is going to uh, force those AV valves to shut. Um, but we don't want them to shut. We don't want to slam the door. So think of your, your, these valves as, as the uh, uh, mechanisms that slow a door down, so stop it from slamming shut. Um, the, the way that your heart accomplishes this is um, through a couple different structures. So chordae tendinae um, are literally strings that connect to, uh, to the flaps of your AV valves. Those strings um, on the other side of them are connected to papillary muscles. So papillary muscles connect to chordae tendinae. Chordae tendinae uh, connect to the, the flaps of your atrioventricular valves and basically prevent those valves from slamming shut. So it just kind of slows the closing of the valves so that we prevent um, unnecessary damage to the valves themselves, right? Because constant slamming of those valves with every single heartbeat um, would cause them to deteriorate over time uh, faster than, than we would want them to. So, um, so the presence of the heart strings and the papillary muscles prevents that uh, deterioration.
All right, so here's a, a good view of what that looks like. So up here we can see the actual cusp, one of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. Uh, and then we see all this stringy stuff attached to it. So that's the chordae tendinae. So all of those strings then attach to a papillary muscle, which is embedded into the, the wall of the heart here. Um, and those, again, those uh, papillary muscles just flex um, to kind of prevent the slamming shut of those valves um, so that we don't do unnecessary damage. Okay, um, so uh, the same thing, similar thing is going to be true for the, the pulmonary semilunar valves. Again, we want those valves to close to prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles after it's been pushed out of the heart. Um, now, the, you might have noticed there are no valves uh, between uh, the atria and the vessels that enter the atria. So there's no valves between the superior and inferior vena cava and the right atrium. There's no valves uh, between the pulmonary veins and the left atrium. Um, and that's just because of the way that the atria actually contract uh, limits the backflow of blood. So we just don't have a whole lot of backflow there to begin with. So vessel, or I'm sorry, valves aren't necessary to prevent what minimal backflow there is. All right, so a few questions for you here. What are the heartstrings? Uh, what muscles are gonna slow the closing of the valves? And what are the atrioventricular valves? All right, so the, the heartstrings are chordae tendinae. So those are little, tiny little tendons that, that attach the, the, uh, the valves to the papillary muscles, which are the muscles that slow the closing of the valves. Uh, and those AV valves are um, correctly called the tricuspid and the mitral, sometimes also called the bicuspid valve. All right, so I want to uh, give you guys a little bit of a background on the actual vessels, and we'll talk much more about vessels in the next video. Um, but for this one, I want to give you just the basic idea of the difference between the arteries and the veins. All right, so arteries are vessels that carry blood away from the heart. So these are always leaving the heart, um, going away from the heart. Um, most of the time, the vessels that are going away from the heart are carrying oxygenated blood, right? So, so the blood is pumping, uh, or the heart's pumping blood all over the body. Um, so we're carrying this oxygenated blood away from the heart to the body. Um, there are exceptions, uh, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, now, most arteries in the body, because of the job that they do, they have a different structure than veins. So the arteries are, um, they usually have thicker walls to them. Um, those walls have a thick uh, layer of smooth muscle in them so that we can use that to control the diameter of these vessels, which helps to control blood pressure. All right, so some three basic components here um, of every vessel is a tunica interna, uh, which is uh, an endothelial lining of the blood vessel itself, a tunica media, that's the middle layer, um, and that's made of smooth muscle, and then a tunica externa, which is essentially a connective tissue um, that's helping um, anchor that, that blood vessel to the surrounding tissue. All right, veins look a little bit different, right? So veins, um, we still have three layers here. We still have a tunica interna that's made of endothelium. We still have a tunica media that's made of smooth muscle uh, and a tunica externa, uh, but that tunica media is a lot thinner, right? So there's not as much musculature here in the, uh, in the veins as there is in the arteries, right? So, and that's because veins usually have lower blood pressure overall. Um, they're usually carrying, well, they're always carrying blood back to the heart um, instead of away from the heart. And as that blood's coming back to the heart, that's usually deoxygenated blood, again, with some exceptions. All right, so um, a few major vessels that you should be aware of. So major arteries um, that are attached to the heart are the aorta. So the aorta is your uh, the largest artery in your body. Um, it has a couple different uh, parts to it. So the ascending aorta is the part of the aorta that goes up right after it leaves the left ventricle. Um, and then it kind of arches over. We have a, a portion called the aortic arch, uh, and then it will descend um, throughout the, the rest of the, the thoracic and abdominal cavity. Um, also leaving the heart is the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is the large vessel that leaves the, the right ventricle. Um, so that pulmonary trunk is a, 
uh, is an example of one of those exceptions where it's a it's an artery it's leaving the right ventricle of the heart um, but because of uh, where it's located it's carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs um, and then also the coronary arteries are um, leaving the heart as well those are going to be carrying oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself okay, so those are all major arteries leaving the heart uh, major veins entering into the heart um, those are your superior and inferior vena cava uh, so those are the two largest uh, veins in the body um, four pulmonary veins. So those four pulmonary veins are uh, all four of them, two left pulmonary veins and two right pulmonary veins are all, all four entering into the, the left atrium. Um, so those are, again, exceptions to this rule. So those are veins, but they're carrying oxygenated blood that just returned from the lungs. Uh, and then also the coronary sinus um, uh, is a, a vein that, that drains the actual heart muscle itself. Okay, um, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the flow of blood through the body. Um, and so we've mentioned this before in the last video when we talked about the order in which blood flows through the heart and these patterns of circulation. So let's separate this into your systemic circuit and your pulmonary circuit. So systemic circuit um, is the circuit that takes blood from the left side of the heart out to the entire body. The pulmonary circuit takes blood from the right side of your heart to the lungs and then back to the heart again. All right, so, um, so here's, uh, here's what the pulmonary circulation looks like. So again, we're bringing um, deoxygenated blood um, into, into the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava. That blood is then gonna go from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the, the right ventricle. It's then going to get pushed out through the pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk then separates into the left uh, pulmonary arteries uh, and the right pulmonary arteries. And that's going to take us to the lungs. At the lungs, we will drop off the carbon dioxide, pick up the oxygen, um, and then come back through the pulmonary veins. Um, so four pulmonary veins here entering back into the, the heart on the, on the left side. So that's your... That's your pulmonary circulation. So taking deoxygenated blood into the right heart, out to the lungs, and then back. Okay, so when we, when we re-enter uh, with this now oxygenated blood into the left side of the heart, we're gonna go from the left atrium uh, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Then the left ventricle will contract and send that blood up through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. So here's here's the aorta here is this, this large red vessel. Um, so we have the ascending aorta going up, then it arches, so we have the aortic arch, and then we have a descending aorta, which goes all the way down back behind the heart uh, and down through the rest of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. All right, so here's that circuit again, just so that we understand um, what's going on here. So if we start with number one uh, here, so the right atrium is receiving deoxygenated blood from three major vessels, superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. It's going through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. Um, the right ventricle will then contract and send that blood through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk then splits into the left and right pulmonary arteries. That's going to take us to the lungs. In the lungs, we will drop off the carbon dioxide, pick up the oxygen, um, and then we're going to go through the pulmonary veins um, back into the left atrium. Um, left atrium will contract, send that blood through the mitral valve, uh, where it will enter the left ventricle. Left ventricle will contract, send that blood through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta, um, and then the aorta is going to branch into smaller and smaller arteries that's gonna carry that blood out throughout the entire rest of the body. We'll eventually get down to capillary beds like this one, uh, and then those capillary beds uh, will uh, merge together again to form small veins. Those small veins will merge to form larger veins, and eventually we get back to our three main vessels that re-enter the heart. Okay, so what type of vessels carry blood away from the heart? what vessels carry blood back toward the heart, what arteries carry oxygen-poor blood, what veins carry oxygen-rich blood, 
what's the purpose of the pulmonary circulation, and what is the purpose of the systemic circulation. All right, so here are your answers. Uh, vessels that carry blood away from the heart are always arteries. Vessels that carry blood back toward the heart are always veins. Um, but we have exceptions to um, which, which of these vessels are going to be carrying oxygen-containing blood and which are not. Um, so, so most arteries carry oxygen poor, I'm sorry, oxygen-rich blood, um, with the exception of the pulmonary arteries, which carry oxygen-poor blood because they're going toward the lungs. Uh, and most veins carry oxygen-poor blood, uh, with the exception of the pulmonary veins, which carry oxygen-rich blood because they're just returning from the lungs. Um, and what's the primary purpose of the pulmonary circulation? And that's to oxygenate the blood, so to drop off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. Uh, and the purpose of the systemic circulation is to deliver oxygen to all the cells in your body. Right? So that's taking that oxygenated blood and delivering it all around. Right? So it makes sure you guys understand the flow of blood to the heart. So we should understand those steps, all the valves that, that we pass through, um, every structure of the heart, you need, to, you need to understand the order in which blood flows through. Okay, so let's talk quickly about these coronary vessels. So I've mentioned them before, um, but the coronary vessels are the vessels that are um, delivering oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself and then draining deoxygenated blood from the heart muscle. So as we deliver this blood to the heart, the heart muscle will take the oxygen from that blood um, and it's going to undergo um, cellular respiration, convert uh, glucose into ATP, and then we wind up with carbon dioxide byproduct from that process, which needs to be delivered away um, back to the lungs. All right, so remember that that thick muscular layer of the heart is called the myocardium. That's the part of the, the heart that's doing all the hard work. So we need to get lots of oxygen, fresh oxygenated blood, um, to that myocardium, and we get it through the coronary arteries. All right, so um, here's a look at some of the major coronary vasculature. So here we can see, um, if we're, we're looking at the, uh, here's your aorta, aortic arch right here. Um, the, one of the first vessels that branches off that aorta is the right coronary artery. So right coronary artery is branching directly off the aorta, and it then branches into smaller and smaller vessels that are delivering oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle itself. Same is true for left coronary artery. So left coronary artery also branches directly off the aorta, and we're carrying fresh oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. Um, if there's any um, obstruction of blood flow, if we're not getting enough um, blood flow to the heart muscle itself, um, that can cause chest pain, um, otherwise known as angina pectoris. Um, and so this is basically what's happening when the, the muscle cells of your heart, so those cardiac muscle cells, instead of being able to do all of the, um, the cellular respiration, the aerobic respiration that they want to be able to do, if they're short on oxygen, it's going to force some of them to do fermentation. Um, so remember that fermentation is that alternate pathway um, that your cells can do if they're not getting enough oxygen. Normally, this is something that your heart, heart muscle cells should not be doing, um, but if they are doing that, it's a sign that they're not getting enough oxygen, right? So that can cause chest pain or angina pectoris. Um, if we completely block some of these coronary vessels, so if we're not getting blood to an area of the, the heart at all, um, then that leads to myocardial infarction. So that's a heart attack if we're not getting blood to that particular area of the heart. All right, so um, on the way out now, so after we delivered that fresh oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself, um, that heart muscle then uses the oxygen, produces carbon dioxide, and now we've got oxygen poor blood. That oxygen poor blood is going to be drained from the heart muscle through coronary veins. Um, all of those coronary veins will then coalesce into one large vessel called the coronary sinus, uh, and the coronary sinus uh, then empties that deoxygenated blood back into the right atrium. Okay, so how does the heart muscle itself receive nutrients? Uh, what drains the blood from the heart muscle? What's angina pectoris and what's a myocardial infarction?
Right, so there's your answers. Coronary arteries are the ones that are delivering nutrients and oxygen to the heart muscle itself. Coronary veins, specifically the coronary sinus, uh, drains the blood from the heart. Um, uh, angina pectoris is chest pain caused by a lack of oxygen. Um, and then myocardial infarction is what happens if you completely block one of your coronary vessels and we, we, you're basically choking off part of the heart muscle of oxygen. Okay, so now that we understand a little bit about how blood flows through the heart and what the major structures of the heart are, um, we should talk a little bit about how the heart beats. Um, so how we trigger the contractions of all these cardiac muscle cells uh, to get a, a rhythmic beat that's going to keep blood flowing smoothly throughout the body. Um, so these heart muscle cells are capable of something called autorhythmicity. Um, auto means self, um, and so self-rhythmic self uh, muscle cells here, and that means that they can keep their own beat. Um, so normally skeletal muscle cells and smooth muscle cells, they need to be told by the nervous system when to contract, right? They can't do that on their own. They have to receive um, a nervous signal and action potential has to jump from a neuron to a muscle cell to trigger uh, contraction. Heart muscle cells can do this on their own. Um, so they maintain their own beat. Um, now they're not totally independent of, of the brain. So you do need some nervous involvement to keep your heart beating at the right pace. Um, but these cells are capable of contracting on their own. All right, so, so let's understand the, the conduction system of the heart. So we've got our own um, kind of uh, electrical conducting cells in the heart. Um, so these are self-excitable myocytes, so muscle cells that act like nerves. All right, so they're, they're capable of sending messages in the same way that nerves are capable of sending messages. Um, and these are gonna, these are what are gonna send the message around the heart, telling the cells when to contract so that we can beat um, synchronously um, and keep a nice rhythm. All right, so your heart has its own built-in pacemaker. That pacemaker of your heart is called the sinoatrial node. So sinoatrial node right here. It kind of sits near, um, near the top of the right atrium. So that's your normal pacemaker of your heart. So sinoatrial node tells the heart how often to contract, right? So that's, that's your pacemaker. So sinoatrial node, once it kind of generates this signal that it's time to contract, the message is gonna get sent. It'll, it'll act like a wave and it'll, it'll wash over the right atrium um, until it finds another node here, the atrioventricular node. So the atrioventricular node or AV node um, is the next step in this process, and it's kind of right, right where the atria and the ventricles meet. All right, so, so the signal goes from the SA node to the AV node. The next step of that is to go through a bundle of fibers um, called, called the atrioventricular bundle, sometimes just called the bundle of his. Um, so this is a, a thick um, bundle of fibers that are going to go from the AV node um, down into this interventricular septum. When we enter into the interventricular septum, uh, we split into two different bundles. So those are gonna be called your left and right bundle branches. So the left bundle branch travels down the left side of the interventricular septum. The right bundle branch branches down the right side of the interventricular septum all the way until we hit the apex of the heart. Uh, when we hit the apex, then these fibers kind of wrap around and go up the outside. Right, so these fibers wrap around. Uh, once the fibers start to wrap around, now we're going to call them Purkinje fibers. So Purkinje fibers are the ones that, that wrap up the bottom of the ventricle. So that's, this is the directionality of the electrical signal. So starting at the, a, the SA node, um, we send that signal all the way across the atrium. So that's going to trigger the atria to contract. Um, uh, the signal will then be picked up by the AV node. It's going to get sent down. Um, the bundle of his, left and right bundle branches, and up the Purkinje fibers, that's going to tell the ventricles to contract. So this is how we get the atria contracting together, and then after the atria relax, then the ventricles contract together. Right? So that's what keeps us kind of working in synchrony. All right, here's another way to kind of visualize this. So if we start over here, you can see our SA node here and our AV node here. 
Um, so as as the SA node starts the starts the signal up here, so we're going to trigger the initial um, electrical signal that starts at the SA node. It's going to wrap around both atria, so it's going to tell both atria to start to contract. So purple here is going to indicate contraction. So in step three, we can see that the atria are both contracting now. So they're sending um, that the information is being sent around the atria, telling those atria to contract, and we can see here that when the atria contract, um, the, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve are both open, right? So atria contract, those two AV valves are open, that's gonna send blood from the atria into the ventricles. Um, next step then is for that signal to go from the AV node uh, down through the interventricular septum, so bundle of his, left and right bundle branches, and then back up these Purkinje fibers here. Um, that's going to trigger the ventricles to contract. So we can see ventricles contracting here. As the ventricles contract, note um, that the, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve are closed at this point. Um, and that's because, again, we don't want backflow. We don't want blood to flow back into the atria. Instead, we want it to flow out of those semilunar valves into the large vessels. Okay, just a, a little bit of terminology here. So a few uh, terms that you should be familiar with. So arrhythmia uh, is an abnormal heart rate or an irregular rate, right? So that means that the rate of the heart is not, is not regular. Fibrillation uh, means an abnormal contraction, right? So the contraction is not normal for, for some reason. Um, tachycardia is a fast heart rate and bradycardia is a slow heart rate. Okay, a couple questions. So what starts the signal for heart contraction uh, and which chambers contract first? All right, so here are your answers. Um, the, the signal for heart contraction starts at the heart's own pacemaker, which is the sinoatrial node, uh, and the chambers that contract first are the atria. All right, so let's talk more about that cardiac cycle. So the cardiac cycle is everything that happens in, in one heartbeat, so one beat of your heart, um, all of the different actions that are going on. So that's going to include um, diastole, which is relaxation, uh, as well as systole, which is contraction. All right, so, so we have, uh, this is happening kind of twice within the heart during each beat. So atrial systole is um, when the atria are contracting, and when those atria are contracting, the ventricles are relaxed. So during atrial systole, the ventricles are in diastole. Uh, and then when the ventricles contract, so we go into vent ventricle systole, um, then the atria are going to be in diastole. Right? So it's always going to be alternating. So if the atria are contracting in systole, then the ventricles are in diastole. If the ventricles are in systole, then the atria are in diastole. So we can't have all four chambers contracting at the same time. It's always two and two. All right, so here's what that looks like. Um, so in atrial systole, atria are contracting. So here we can see uh, in, at the uh, 12 o'clock in this picture here, we can see blood entering into the atria. So the atria are filling with blood. That blood is coming from either the, the superior and inferior vena cava on the right side, or it's coming from the pulmonary veins on the left side. Um, so that blood enters into the atria, then the atria begins to contract. Um, when it begins to contract, then it's gonna squeeze that blood um, into the ventricles, right? So atrial systole means that the ventricles are relaxed. Uh, when the ventricles are relaxed, they're able to fill with blood, right? Then once the ventricles are filled with blood, uh, then we, we move on to this next picture here. So the atrioventricular valves are going to close shut. Um, the ventricles are going to contract and they're going to start to push blood um, up and out through the, the semilunar valves. Right? So here we can see the ventricles are contracting in this picture. Um, so that's going to be pushing blood up through the pulmonary semilunar valve and out to the lungs and then through the aortic semilunar valve and out to the body. Right, so that's, that's where our, our ventricles are in uh, total systole. And notice that while the ventricles are in syst systole, they're contracting, um, the, the atria are in diastole. So the atria are now relaxed, meaning that they're able to relax and fill with blood that's coming in uh, from, from those vessels, returning blood either from the body or from the lungs.
Okay, so uh, more questions. What are systole and diastole? Uh, when the atria contract, what are the ventricles doing? When the ventricles contract, what are the atria are do what are the atria doing? And then what valves are going to be closed at that time? Okay, so here are your answers. So diastole and systole are relaxation and contraction, respectively. So re relaxation is diastole, contraction is systole. When the atria contract, the ventricles are relaxed. When the ventricles contract, the atria are relaxed. Um, and at that time, when the atria are relaxed, the, the atrioventricular valves uh, need to be closed. Okay, so let's talk about how we measure the electrical activity in the heart. And we measure that through an electrocardiogram, or EKG. Um, so an EKG is just a recording of all of the electrical changes that are happening in the heart um, that allow for, for systole and diastole. All right, so we're basically measuring, um, we're measuring deflections of electrical activity, so changes uh, in electrical activity. So remember that um, that your, your cells are polarized, right? We have polarized membranes, which means that we've got a slightly negative charge on the inside of the membrane, a slightly positive charge on the outside of the membranes. Um, those differences in charge are maintained by, uh, those charge gradients are maintained by sodium potassium pumps, which are, are, are constantly um, maintaining that negative overall charge on the inside of the cell. Um, so that we can have a gradient that can be eventually depolarized when necessary. All right, so the, the EKG is measuring those depolarizations. All right, and so here's what a normal EKG looks like. Um, so uh, a few things I want you guys to pay attention when you're looking at an EKG like this. Um, uh, one is, the, the first one is this P wave. So the P wave is this, this little kind of bump at the beginning of the cycle here. Uh, next thing is the QRS complex, so QRS, so that's where we kind of deflect down, then go back up, way up, uh, and then back way down to S, All right? So QRS is the next one that we have to pay attention to. And then uh, the last thing we should notice is this T wave here, All right? So, so each one of these deflections represents something that's going on electrically in the heart. Um, so the first one, uh, the P wave represents um, atrial depolarization. So when the atria depolarize, that means we're getting an electrical signal through the atria. That atrial depolarization, that electrical signal, is going to trigger those muscle cells that are in the atria to contract. Uh, when they contract, um, then that's, that's atrial systole. So that's what's happening at the P wave. So P wave represents atrial depolarization, which is going to result in atrial systole. Um, the next step here is there's all this activity that's associated with this QRS complex. Um, so that QRS complex um, is a much larger amount of electrical activity that's happening when the ventricles depolarize. So remember that the ventricles are much, much bigger. Um, there are many more muscle cells here. They're very uh, powerful. Um, so that ventricular depolarization causes a much stronger ventricular contraction. Um, so that's what we're seeing that's initiated with that QRS complex. Uh, and then the T wave, uh, the last little kind of deflection that we see on an EKG here is this T wave. The T wave is going to represent the, um, the repolarization of the ventricles. So that after the ventricles have, uh, have depolarized, then eventually they need to repolarize themselves so that they can depolarize again for the next heartbeat. Um, that repolarization uh, we can visualize uh, by looking at that T wave. Um, so common question is, well, when do the when do the atria repolarize? And the answer is, the atria are repolarizing during that QRS complex, but the repolarization of the atria is such a small deflection um, that we can't see it uh, as easily uh, because it's being kind of swamped out by all the changes that are happening for uh, ventricular depolarization. All right, so here they are again. So again, P wave, this first little wave here is your P wave. That's going to represent the depolarization of the atria. Next thing we see is the QRS complex. QRS complex is going to represent the depolarization of the ventricles. Uh, and then the last wave here is the T wave, and that's the repolarization of the ventricles. So you should be familiar uh, with those deflections on a normal EKG.
All right, and so here's how if we combine the actual electrical activity, so the, the depolarization and repolarization, with what's going on as far as contraction and relaxation. Right, because remember an EKG is just measuring electrical activity. It's not measuring contraction. It's only measuring the electrical signal. All right, so our atria here are relaxed. Atria are in diastole until we get that P wave. Right, so that P wave is gonna say, okay, it's time for the atria to contract. So it sends the electrical signal and now we'll get atrial systole. So atria contracting. Um, and now, during this entire time, the ventricles have been in diastole. And they're gonna stay in diastole until um, the QRS complex comes along. That QRS complex is the, the depolarization of the atria, so, or of the ventricles. So when we depolarize, depolarize the ventricles, we go into ventricular systole. Um, at, at roughly at that same time, we're gonna repolarize our atria. You won't be able to see that because of the larger deflections of the ventricles, the atria are then going to be in diastole this whole time, um, refilling with blood. Um, uh, after ventricular systole is complete, then we need to repolarize uh, the ventricles. That's our T wave. So as we're repolarizing them, then the ventricles can go back into diastole. Right? So all of that combined gives us one single cardiac cycle where, where we have atrial depolarization, contraction of the atria, ventricular depolarization, um, contraction of the ventricles, followed by the ventricular repolarization to get ready for the next heartbeat. Okay, um, I'll let you guys look these over on your own. So these are um, some basic um, e e abnormalities that you might see on an EKG, so when things are going wrong. Um, so again, since we're measuring electrical activity with an EKG, uh, when we're seeing something going wrong on an EKG, that's an indication that something's wrong with the electrical signal as it's passing through the heart. Right? So that's what we're looking for in all these different things. It's telling us that something is wrong with the way the electricity is moving through the heart. All right, so uh, different heart sounds. So when you listen to someone's heartbeat, um, you're hearing a few sounds. So we, um, you've probably listened to a heartbeat before and you hear that, that kind of lubbed up sound, lubbed up loved up. Um, so, so two basic sounds that are easy to hear, and that first one is, is the lub sound. Um, the, the actual sound you're hearing, a lot of times people think that you're hearing contraction, you're not. Uh, what you're hearing is the sound of valves closing. So that first sound, the lub sound, or sound one, that's the sound of your atrioventricular valves closing. So remember that they close um, after atrial systole, when, when the atria are about to go relax again, um, the ventricles will contract and that will force those valves to close. The forcing of them shut um, is the lub sound. The next sound we hear is the dup sound. Dup sound is the sound that happens after the, or happens when the semilunar valves close. So ventricles contract, they push all that blood out through the semilunar valves into the major vessels. Uh, and then those semilunar valves kind of shut the door behind them, um, and that's the dup sound. So those sounds are just the sounds of valves uh, closing. Um, murmurs are, uh, are just the sound of turbulent flow in the heart. Right? So if the valves aren't closing and opening properly, if we've got some, some turbulent flow, so instead of smooth flow, there's, it's like, like uh, rapids, essentially, um, that's what murmurs are, uh, and we can rank murmurs by their sound from one to six. Okay, um, uh, so cardiac output um, is a term that describes how much blood can be ejected from the heart in one single minute. So um, in order to calculate cardiac output, we have to measure the volume um, of blood ejected from the ventricles, uh, multiply that times the heart rate, so how many times the ventricles do that in every minute. Right? So cardiac output is stroke volume, the volume of blood uh, that gets uh, pushed out, times the heart rate, which is the number of times that heart beats in one minute. And so that's how we calculate cardiac output. So cardiac output uh, in a normal resting male We'd say that those ventricles are ejecting about 70 milliliters of blood. Um, the average heartbeat about 75 beats per minute totals up to about uh, a little bit over five liters per minute in a normal resting male, right? So, and that number is gonna vary 
depending on uh, the sex uh, of the person, the amount of activity they're doing, um, their, their fitness level, and things like that. Okay, so a few things that can affect the cardiac output. Um, so the chronotropic effect, um, chrono refers to time. So this is the effect that time has. So that means um, uh, the amount, the speed with which the heart is beating. So you, you beat the heart faster, um, you're gonna get a higher cardiac output just because you're putting more, uh, more beats out there for every minute. Um, and then there are things that are going to affect the stroke volume as well. So things that affect the stroke volume um, are uh, preload. Preload has to do with, um, with the amount of ventricular filling that happens. Um, so, so the ventricles can only pump what they can take in. So um, if, if the preload is not enough to completely load up those ventricles with blood, then they won't be able to push out as much, which would reduce the stroke volume. All right, so that preload also called the dromotropic effect. Um, so the strength of the contraction is also going to be important here. So how forceful each one of those contractions is to push that blood back out into the vessels. Uh, and also the resistance of the vessels that we're pushing the blood into. So as you push the blood into um, the aorta, um, the aorta can only expand so much to take that blood that's being pushed into it. Um, so that's what's, what we refer to as afterload. So the kind of pressure on the aorta itself that's going to limit the amount uh, uh, that the ventricles can push. Okay, so all these things um, are going to affect your cardiac output. So we've been talking about the stroke volume, so things like the size of your heart is gonna affect the stroke volume. Larger hearts will have a higher stroke volume, they'll be able to push more blood. Um, fitness levels affect stroke volume, so the stronger your heart is, the more, the, the more easily capable it is to push that, that blood out. Uh, gender, contractility, um, so that how contractible um, the heart muscle is, um, the, and then the preload and the afterload, which I just mentioned. Um, so all of those things contribute to the, the volume um, that the, blood, the ventricle can push out per stroke. Um, and then we multiply that times the heart rate, and things that affect the heart rate are um, you know, basic things that you would expect. So your age affects your heart rate, your level of fitness affects your heart rate, but also hormones. Um, so certain hormones can trigger the heart rate to increase or decrease. Uh, and then the amount of autonomic innervation. So remember that your, your heart rate also is influenced um, by autonomic tone. Uh, so it's not completely independent of your nervous system. Okay, so um, stroke volume, uh, just to kind of go back to this idea of preload, stroke volume is going to be affected by how much uh, the size of the ventricle itself and how, how the ventricle is able to expand to, to fill with blood. Um, so the, so the, the more it's able to stretch to fill with blood, the higher the preload. Um, and that the, the preload is going to determine um, your cardiac or your stroke volume, which will in turn uh, influence the cardiac output. So the heart can only pump out what the heart can take in, essentially. Um, and that, that concept is known as Starling's Law of the Heart. So um, the heart can only pump out what it can take in. It can't pump out any more than what can enter. Um, now, something else that can control this is uh, the, your sympathetic stimulation. So again, autonomic tone plays an important part in heart rate. Um, sympathetic tone is going to do things like increase the heart rate and stroke volume. Uh, parasympathetic tone will decrease it uh, when you're in your rest and relaxation phase. All right. Again, lots of things influence heart rate. Normal heart rate rate can range anywhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Um, average is roughly 72, but again, this is um, highly variable. Changes over the course of time, over the course of the day, minute by minute can change. Um, so exercise, activity level, age, gender, size of your body, stress levels obviously impact your heart rate. Uh, and then uh, anything lower than 60 beats per minute is usually uh, referred to as bradycardia. Anything above 100 beats per minute, it's a high heart rate, that's tachycardia. Okay, and then this concept of cardiac reserve. So cardiac reserve is the difference between your cardiac output at rest and your maximum cardiac output when you're when you're doing the absolute most. So 
So your cardiac output when you're just totally sitting on the couch and not doing anything versus the cardiac output that your heart is capable of if you're if you're running a race or you know doing the maximum exercise effort. Um, so that cardiac reserve is the difference between those two numbers, and it's usually um, the reserve is about four to five times the resting value. So your your heart rate can or your cardiac output can increase dramatically uh, depending on uh, what's going on in your environment. All right, last few questions here. How do you calculate cardiac output? Um, what does the P wave represent on an EKG? And then what does the T wave represent? So we calculate cardiac output by multiplying the stroke volume times the heart rate. So SV times HR equals CO. Uh, the P wave on an EKG represents atrial depolarization. And the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. All right, so I know that was a lot of material. Um, I hope this is helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.